This is the word of the Lord, sorry. And today's sermon will be by our brother BG. <clears throat> The uh, chapter that was read to us is the sad chapter of the exile of the nation of Israel. Ten tribes of the nation of Israel would be sent away and they'll never come back. <clears throat> Ten out of the twelve. And um, something that had happened to the Amorites about 700 years earlier, the reason that they were sent away. God had given them 400 years, and uh, it's called the iniquity of the Amorites, if you read about it. They were given 400 years, and now it's a time for the northern kingdom uh, to be sent away in exile for the very same reason. We've been doing a sermon series, The Road to Emmaus, and uh, the last time, last few weeks ago, we looked at the Davidic covenant, the covenant that God uh, gives to David and says, your son will sit on the throne forever. It's an unconditional covenant. It's a covenant that will bring great joy, saying that, you know, there's, there's this continuity that God has promised. But then when you get to chapters like this that tells us about exile, about God sending them away, punishing them for the very reason that the Amorites were punished, we start to ask what is happening in this redemptive ark, isn't it? And um, <clears throat> because we know David, uh, if that condition, this unconditional covenant were left to David, uh, he, 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 he wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have survived. What about Solomon? The very reason the Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, was because Solomon had sold himself to evil. And so right through the story, we see that there is this continuous evil that is happening, and, and um, it ends in exile. In fact, the northern kingdom, they had 20 kings, 20 kings, and none of them were good in the sight of God. They did what was evil in, their, in, the, in, you know, in the sight of God. They did what they wanted to do. And this is actually Genesis 3. We've been looking at it, right? I mean, they, Adam and Eve, they did what was right in their own eyes. We saw that in Judges. And now we see uh, Israel being sent away in exile. In fact, the very first few acts of Jeroboam, the first king of the northern kingdom, was that he, he beats Aaron by not building just one golden calf, but two golden calves. And he puts one in Dan and other in Bethel. <clears throat> and uh, just as a information, you might take it, right? I mean, it's interesting that God would not be mocked. When we get to Revelation and we read about the list of the tribes, Dan is missing and Ephraim is missing, the two tribes. Those are the two places where these golden calf and the, uh, the, the beginning of this, not beginning, but the, the, the pit of idolatry, if you would, had happened. Maybe that's the reason. The Bible doesn't specify. But those two tribes are missing in that list in Revelation. And so what we, what we also see that when <clears throat> Jeroboam actually um, uh, builds these two calf, God sends a prophet. And in 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 15, we see Ahijah, the prophet, he confronts uh, Jeroboam and he says, Then the Lord will shake Israel like a reed whipped out in a stream. And then the latter part says, we'll scatter them beyond the Euphrates. Now, at that point in time, the world had not seen a kingdom so vast because this is about 1,500 kilometers away across Euphrates. They never believed that anybody from that far off will come and take them, and, you know, take them captive. But it's easy not to believe in God's warning when the threat seems impossible. 
And so we see this nation, after 209 years of being that northern kingdom, God's grace continuing. Ahab, he, he, he was one of the most evil of the kings. A and he must just bring thanks to your heart because when Ahab repented, God was willing to give grace to Ahab. So it is not the lack of God's grace. It's just the rebellion of man that leads to exile. And so when you say the Old Testament God is a God of anger and wrath, you got it wrong. It is a God of mercy and loving kindness. In fact, this chapter 17 is about Hoshea, who is the last king of Israel. And Hosea, the prophet, comes and prophesies to him in Hosea 10.7. We read, as for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. If you remember the prophecy that was given to Jeroboam 207 years ago, and now to Hoshea, the last king, the same prophecy, that if you rebel against God, you'll be like a twig cut off on the water. The northern kingdom, therefore, a book ended with these warnings but they don't repent. So there's a lesson for us. And the lesson for us, what we're going to do today is we look at this chapter. I want to do it in three parts. We'll do a quick review. and We'll see the context and the conditions. We'll see the reasons as to why God sends them away and then the result and what's the consequence. But I want you, dear brothers and sisters, at this point, take your pens out, write notes. This is the word of God. I know... It sounds like a human voice, but he's speaking to me and he speaks to you. Because you need to write down so that you can go back and review. Let not God's word fall down, uh, just like Samuel did not allow the word of God to fall on the ground. May this word come to you on this first Sunday of the week. May it be that you have understood and seen clearly the grace of God and have forborne the warning and you have heard that for ourselves. And so with that, let me just pray and then we'll start. Okay, Father, we want to thank you, God. Thank you for your word that has been, that has come to us consistently. And this morning, we wait to hear from you. I wait as you have been speaking to me, but I still wait because each time we hear your word, Lord, it's, it digs deeper into our soul. It, it sheds light into those spots where we, have, we try to hide from ourselves, from the others, but the light of the gospel would shine deep into those places, into those recesses of our hearts. May it find every little thing that is an abomination to you and be cast away, O oh God, through the hearing and the obedience to your word. We thank you again, Lord, in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. Amen. So let's just do a review. Verses 1 to 6 is going to be a review. And now the chapter begins with Hoshea's reign. He's the last king of the northern kingdom. Look at verse 2. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. I was like, okay, so he was not as bad as the rest of them, so why is God, uh, you know, sending him in exile? And this is the lesson. God will punish not just the most wicked, but all the wicked. If you think that God has to punish just the most wicked, you're mistaken because oftentimes, you know, sometimes you say, why doesn't God do anything about that? That's just so evil. and God needs to do something about it. If, you, if it were for me, I would have done it. I would have done something, right? We, I've said it. I know I've said it. Like, you're just like so impatient. But there's two problems with that. One, you're making yourself wiser than God. You're saying, you know better than what God needs to do. The second is that we have a high self-estimation. We think much about ourselves. And that's why we think, oh, he needs to be punished. She needs to be punished. They need to be punished. But the finger never gets pointed at ourselves. 
Because if God were to judge, he will judge not just the most wicked, but all the wicked. If you have no righteousness of Jesus Christ that covers you, you are under that same condemnation. That is one lesson that we begin this with. And so, as we look at, now let's look at verse 4. <clears throat> verse 4, it says, the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea. And what, what he does is, uh, he, he was uh, paying tribute to this king. Now the father had died, the son had come, and so he thought he'd find, uh, you know, he'll stop giving the tribute. But uh, what he does, the, the king of Assyria comes and, and uh, imprisons him. Hoshea is actually given a second chance. When he was in the prison, in prison, if he had repented, he probably would have delayed God's judgment. Because earlier, we've seen Manasseh. Manasseh would be put in prison. There are others who would be put in prison. And, and there, when they repented, God would offer mercy. But no, in this case, nothing seems to happen. And so when you get to verse 6, I'm going to put up a, a map there in verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea, listen to this, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Hebor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. If you see the map that takes you right through, we can, we'll touch on this a little later, but that's about 1,500 kilometers across and past the river Euphrates. Just as it was prophesied to Jeroboam, God keeps his promises and fulfills his prophecies, good and even the ones that are warnings. God keeps his promise and fulfills his prophecies. But as you look down, we ask the, ask the question, why? What's the reason? Why does God do all this from verse 7 to 17? And we have a list of 27 evils. Now, this is like standing in a court, giving out the, in the court of law, all the charges that have been given. There's 27 of those given out. Now, I want to touch very quickly on just four of that because it's a good reminder that these sins that were listed out were not just specific to them, but they keep getting repeated in our times and maybe in your lives. And so the first one, verse 7, <clears throat> they feared other gods. Not fearing Yahweh, but fearing other gods. Two errors. They were to fear Yahweh God. They don't fear him, but they fear other gods. And you've got to ask yourself, what's the God you fear? today. You know, the fear that you can't pay your mortgage. Maybe you're stuck in a job that you want to get out, but you can't, and you'll, you'll, you survive that, you're okay, but then, you know, is, is that the fear? Is, is, is your job paying you the money? And, you know, you got to ask yourself, what's your fear? You, you find what you fear has become your God. Look at verse 8. Walked in the customs of the other nations. No distinguishing behavior or practice that points us as being different from our colleagues or neighbors or friends. There's no distinguishing. I, I remember some years ago speaking to uh, um, a millennial, I would say, a young, young man. And uh, he would use swear words. And I, so I, I spoke to him and I said, uh, is that right? Is that okay? And he was trying to convince me, saying that, you know, in our generation, we, for us, it's not a swear word. It's just an expression. It's not what we mean. Now I had to say to him, you know, there's nothing called a party mouth Christian. You cannot be that. You cannot be speaking the language of Jesus Christ with that mouth. In fact, you're extolling the virtues of the devil. You cannot if there's no distinguishing factor between you and the rest, that something is wrong. We've forgotten what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. And so maybe that is an issue. You can ask that for yourself, but verse 9, let's look at another one. 
and they did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. Now, that's the paradox, isn't it? We think we can do secretly against a God who knows everything, sees everything, but we've fallen for the lie. You know what this is and how we see it in our times? We've fallen for the lie that if it doesn't hurt someone else, it's okay. Porn among Christians is rampant because we've fallen for that. We think it's okay. I'm not hurting anybody. And do it secretly. Illicit things, secretly. That could be thing that might point out to you. Go through, go through the 27. I'll give you one more in verse 11. Offering <clears throat> on all the high places. Randy Alcon had this great article on the modern day high places. And so what is a high place for us in a modern setting? A high place are the places of worship where people offer their best. I think that's a too good a definition. Wherever you offer your best, that has become your high place. And in our times, and I think in our setting, the three or four high places is sports and entertainment and leisure and fashion, maybe. Right? I was reading a Washington Post about uh, Swella, uh, Taylor Swift and an heiress. She made $4.1 billion, and her fans spent on an average of $1,100 per show. And you compare that to what Christians on an average give for their tithe and their offering for the whole year is $831. Now, this is not a plug for offerings. This is keep your money. If you don't want to give, that's okay. That's God is not becoming poor. But this is a good reminder where we spend our energies, where we spend our money, where we think we get the most excitement, the things that that gives us the most fear. That may have become our high place, and that may have become our God. And so don't read through this thinking that this was something for them. This could be something that's really for us. We take our children and we offer them in the altar of success we want. That's become a chemosh and our, our molek. We offer our children, with, there's this obsession for our children to be successful. We treat them and do everything, but somehow the word of God is not, it's just sidelined. It's not as important. Uh, you know, we started this with our Sunday school children. I hope our Sunday school children are still writing notes. Yeah, thank you. Exciting. Thank you, Swirat. You know why? You know, you know why this is important? We never go to our class. We've never, I mean, you, you've been out of class for a long time, I guess. Some of us are children. We, we still, we never go to a class and not write notes. We, we write our notes in, our, in, in school, and that's okay. When we come here, we just, we don't. How is it that God's word is not treated higher in its importance, eternal importance? We, we, everything else becomes important, and maybe we are offering our children there. All this listed in these 27. You'll find your own 27. But what does God do? What does God do? Look at verse 13. He sent repeated warnings through prophets and seers. He initially had warned through Moses before they got into the land in Deuteronomy. He, he said, you know, there will come a time when you will, you know, you will go after these other gods. And so he told them, you, you will go in exile. And then there were these prophets that were sent during the darkest times of Israel, Ahab's time, and, and he was one of the evil king. And during that time, they had Elijah, and then later, Elisha. The darkest times is where God sends his prophets. And just before exile, there was this, as it were, this cluster of prophets God sends. 
to warn them again and again and again, to tell them the truth that, listen, if you think you're in bondage by obeying God and God's law, you just have to just realize that the, the world outside of the boundaries of this goodness of God is evil and wicked and will destroy you. Don't assume that you're free outside of God's laws. God's laws are good. That's what David was saying. Your laws are good. I meditate on them. Verse 14. Verse 14 says, But they were stubborn as their fathers had been, and they did not believe in the Lord. Stubborn. Step-necked. These are like the oxen who would not want the yoke to be put on them. And Jesus says, my yoke is light. And you don't want this yoke? See what you're calling yourself for, waiting, what you are seeking yourself out. And verse 15, they went after false idols and became false. I think I, it couldn't be clearer than that. You make your own idols. A false idol will only make you false. And so let's review. What's the result, sorry? Verses 16 to 23. Rebellion against God will lead to bondage. 16 to 17, God continues his indictment about all the things that were going wrong, and God had made it very clear that when you go into the land, make sure that you, uh, you, uh, you chase away those Canaanites. And you annihilate them. You destroy them, because if you don't, then you will have a problem. They will make you like them. But they thought, we'll subjugate them. We'll make them slaves. We'll make them work for us. I mean, that's great, right? We got some extra hand. It'll be good for former slaves to now be slave owners. And we forget that very soon sin will become your master. They forgot the principle that sin has to be put to death, not controlled. You cannot put a leash on sin and say that I got the sin in control. Sin will overcome you. You are not as strong as the sin that you're committing. Modify the flesh. Revelation, uh, Romans 6 is very clear. Put to death. Nothing beyond that. Put to death sin in your life. Because habits, we think those habits are okay. We think habits can be tamed. Our young people sometimes think, well, that's okay. You know what? I've, I've, got, I've got it under control. I've got this. I can get out whenever I want. That's the deception of addiction. Every addict thinks that they can walk away. And they have fooled themselves. Sin is just like that. And so in our times, what we do is we, we try to, uh, we look at God's word and says, ah, did God really say that? You know, that's Genesis 3 again. And like the boiling frog syndrome, right? People are destroyed by their own truths we try to make up. That was Satan's ploy in, Gen in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. And well-meaning Christians have fell fallen for it. So I think on the first Sunday of this year, it's good to say we should, we will we'll commit to say we will take God's word at his word. Not try and say, oh, someone else says it differently, or this is something, or the many people read it differently. But what is God telling you? It's going to hold you responsible. It's going to hold you responsible. It's not going to, it's just like that, you know, oh, they, they, someone else told me something else. Be convinced by the word of God. Look at verse 18. What happens as a result there? The Levitical blessings are reversed. He removed them out of his sight. You know, Numbers uh, 6, 22 to 23, that the face of the Lord would be turned on us. That's the Levitical blessing. And here we see that he turns his face away. Verse 20, he rejected them and gave them into the hand of the plunderers. Verse 21 to 23, 
not just the king, but you will see that the people and 22 people of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam did. The king and the subject both have sinned. And so verse 23, so, exile, so sorry, Israel was exiled from their own land unto Assyria until this day. <clears throat> and it's important that we pause long enough to find what happened in this exile or how did this exile go about to be in the hands of Assyria? First, we have the cruelty of the Assyrians. The ancient Assyrian manuscripts will tell us that they would either maim the captives or make them weak. As they walk on this journey of 1,500 kilometers, I think that's a stone relic uh, 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 carving that is there, so it's not very clear, but in the writing, so what they've done is they will put a fish hook on the lower lip on each of those prisoners as they walk for 1,500 kilometers. That's the way they would be led, and sometimes they are led naked, maimed because they want to make them weak, naked because they want to put them to shame. And you know something? Amos had prophesied in Amos chapter 4, verses 2 to 3, that I'll draw them with fish hooks. God has been warning. He doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the second strategy is in verse 24, the strategy of the repopulation. The Assyrians knew for one that if you take the national identity of the person, assimilation into the Assyrian kingdom is easy. So they would take a conquered land and take some of them and distribute them in different places and from these places put them into this place in, in the northern kingdom. Now, the beauty of this, now, this is the first part of exile. The next Sunday, God willing, we'll look at the, the other exile. But you will see how in the Assyrian strategy and the Babylonian strategies are too different. The Assyrian strategy, they assimilate. And they brought in these people to live in this land, in this northern kingdom. And ha having lived there, the idea of this every nation, verses 24 to 41, you'll see from every nation, or that's the phrase that is used. And the Assyrian strategy seems to have worked because in Samaria, if you remember from John chapter 4, that the Samaritans who were called half-breeds, so they had no, the, Samaria, the, the Jews would have nothing to do with the Samarians because they had become so totally unlike a Jew. They had become just like the people of the land. So exile happens with the very, the, 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 the pre-conquest era, before Israel came in, the way the land was, this land has now become just like that. The people are taken away, you know, the chapter doesn't end. There are more lessons after this. People are taken away, but the lessons continue. And I want to draw our attention to some of the sins there that could be, that can help us understand our context. So verses 25 to 18, uh, sorry, 25 to, um, anyways, 25 onwards, we have the sin of presumption. That is, they had, um, what had happened is, and we didn't read that, but you can go back in verse 25, you see that when these population were brought into Samaria, that God sends lions among them and kills somebody. And so they, they go to the king saying that the, the people, of, the God of this land is upset because he's not appeased. And so you've got to do something. So he, go, the, he brings some of the priests back so that they can teach the people there by the things of the Lord. Now, there's two assumptions that's going on here. One is the Yahweh God, the El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, is called just a tribal God, the, land, the God of the land, God of that land. He's not just the God of that land. He's the God of all heaven and all earth. That's one mistake they do. The second mistake they do is these priests who are brought back are not the Levitical priests of the Lord. 
Because Jeroboam, we read about that in 1 Kings chapter 12 in 26 to 31, that when he put these two calves up, golden calves up, he makes the lowest people priest. And then we read that here also in 30, 32, that when these... Uh, when they, uh, let's read 32. And they also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves all sorts of people as priests of high places who sacrificed them in the shrines of the high place. So these priests who come to teach are not really teaching about the Yahweh God. The sin of presumption. But there's also a sin of assumption. Verses 29 to 30, we have what's called the sin of assumption. Israel was brought into bring the worship of the Yahweh God to that land. But they had assumed that these slaves that they are made of the Canaanites will eventually become uh, like them. They would start to fear the Yahweh God. But that's not what happens. They, unfortunately, become like them, like the Canaanites, full of idolatry, and pagan practices. If you read through that, you will see they are offering their sons and daughters just like the nations before. But I want to spend a little time on another sin there from verses 32 to 33. You want to call it the sin of syncretism. Okay, Sunday school, you got to hear this word, okay? That word up there, it's called syncretism. All right, I wanted to bring a prop up, but I forgot. But I want you to assume here, listen to me. You got a good glass of, I mean, got a clean glass of water. I got a dirty glass of water. Where do I drink from? Clean glass, dirty glass? The clean glass, right? Okay, I'm going to bring clean glass. I'll take another glass. I, I pour a lot of this good uh, water from the clean glass and a little bit from the dirty glass. Can I drink this? No. That is syncretism. That is you take things from, from God's word, good things from God's word, and then you mix it up with certain other things. And it, it's not as bad as the other, but that is syncretism. Syncretism is taking different forms of cuisines, cultures, ethnic practices, or faith beliefs. Now, there's good syncretism, because I know you all, most of you like Hakka noodles. Uh, hack, what is that? Hakka cuisine. Hakka cuisine, right? I mean, all right, you, you, it's, a, it's a good syncretism. Or karate, or all of those, right? That's syncretism, and, and in, a, in a sense, it's okay, uh, because it's just, it's food and other things, so that's all right. But I came across one called the Christian yoga. And um, <clears throat> I think the problem with that, and the website says, a call to enjoy the benefits without participating in the ritual. Now, I, 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 I think it is dangerous to, to see that that would happen because Proverbs chapter 6, 27 says, how can you take fire in your lap and not be burnt? If you understand, I, I, my, I think it's a distant sister-in-law, I would say. They've gone to this, and they have made them say things during the yoga time, and they just keep quiet, but they just want to do the breathing exercise. Now, I'm not here to, uh, you know, do a class in yoga or anti-yoga, but please understand how syncretism comes in is very subtle. We think it's okay in a little bit, a little bit, just like the boiling frog. So I want you to listen to verses 32 to 33, what is happening. Look at the conjunctions, the also and the and and the but. Verses 32. They also feared the Lord. They also, listen to that, and appointed for among themselves all sorts of people as priests and of the high places, who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they feared the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. The also and the and and the but. I think that is the question before us. How much of the syncretism have we taken in. I want to give you some examples so that it becomes real. One is the syncretism of pragmatism. Pragmatism, sorry. 
a belief that if it is logical, it is biblical. If it is practical, it is okay. If it works, it is good. We have confused practicality with biblical truth. Very pragmatic, very practical. We think if it's logical, it should be reasonable and it should be biblical. And pragmatism is not new. It started in the Garden of Eden. The devil made a practical suggestion. He said, you'll be like gods, knowing good and evil. That's very practical. Well, I would love to know what is good and evil. Pragmatism will convince you that if someone were to put a gun to your head and say, deny Christ, and you would say, yes, I'll deny Christ because then I can just go say sorry to Jesus later. If that were the case, there would be no martyrs through history. And if that were the case, Jesus would not have said, Matthew chapter 10, 33, whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We don't take Jesus the King lightly. True, there may be your mental state or you may be so beat, you know, whatever it is, but in your own heart, to just save your life, if you have rebelled and if you have denied Christ, that would be a very practical step, but that is not necessarily biblical. Second, cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity says it's a good mix of the Bible and the culture, and I, you know, some was it last year or a year before when I went to Bangladesh, one of the things that happens there is what's called the Chrislam. They've, they've allowed you to be um, a, 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 a following Islam, but you also follow Christ. How does that work? That's syncretism. And, and, and that might be an extreme example, but I think the point is we need to ask for ourselves, how have we mixed our own understanding, our own cultural bias to what God is saying? Individualism, that's another one. The North American obsession for privacy and individuality that has found its place in the church. The unwillingness to be held accountable. Sometimes, you know, like, that's okay, you tell anything, but don't tell me that I'm doing something wrong. That, I think, is an antithesis to a Christian community. A church is to hold each other accountable and to, to encourage each other, to build each other, to rebuke where it's necessary so that we are holy before God. There's also the social gospel, the wokeness that is going through most churches. The social gospel that really says that, you know, must focus on this justice and social upliftment and racism and all that. And, and each of them are good in its own, but they're not good by themselves without the gospel. Because without the gospel, all the good thing that you've done, all the soup kitchens that you may have run, you have fed them, you have dressed them well, you've educated them, and you've sent them to hell. And that will not be the gospel. You do all the care that we do, we do that because of the gospel, of because of who Jesus Christ is meant for us. So upliftment and, and education and all of those are necessary things, but in the light of the gospel, not apart from it. Look at God's assessment in chapter 34, uh, chapter 17, verses 34 to 41. In verse 34, he goes on to list, again, five things. God, God's actually repeating it. He says, you know, I'm letting you know that these are serious issues. And then, you know, I like this quote by Charles Spurgeon as to why God is intolerant. I'm going to listen to this. False gods patiently endure the existence of other false gods. Dagon can stand with Bel and Bel with Asheroth. How could stone and wood and silver be moved to indignation? But because God is the only living and true God, Dagon must fall before his ark. 
Bell must be broken and Ashroth must be consumed with fire. Where the living God, Yahweh God is, there's no place for Chemosh or Dagon or any other God. It's only him and him alone. Look at verse 35. It's a reminder that God gets into a covenant with them. He's just told you all the things that has happened. And he reminds them, I got you into a covenant. I said, I'll take care of you. I got you covered. We went after other things. <clears throat> and I'm running out of time, but I need to tell you the story. This is a very, I read the story about uh, Samuel Naftal, who was a preacher in Mozambique. In 2000, Mozambique had the highest level of rainfall in 50 years in February towards the end, but by March 2nd, uh, millions were displaced, and about 7,000 of them were stuck in trees because when the flood started to come, they climbed up the trees, and they couldn't come down now because the swirling waters, there's this carcasses and dead bodies just you know, floating around, and so they're sitting there on those treetops. And so Samuel Naftal starts to preach because he wants to keep them awake. Now, th these are days they're going to be sitting there. And he got tired. And then he says, I began thankful for the first time to be, to be thankful for the mosquitoes. Because it was the mosquitoes that kept me awake and kept them awake from falling down into the swirling waters below. So I'm not sure what are the mosquitoes that you've been swatting since 23. Some of the things that you're, you know, has been your irritation or like your need for an answer prayer or whatever it is. And you can be thankful for these mosquitoes because they've kept you awake. But look what it's saying. It's, it's saying that when you seek to go away and rebel and move away, you are getting yourself into trouble. My word for every little dot and tittle, everything is important for relationships, for, for worship. Don't let anything fall to the ground, my brothers and sisters. Let's just get, let's say that this God is worthy of all of our obedience. Because listen to what 40 and 41 and it says, they feared the Lord, but also served their carved images. The clearest definition of syncretism. So I want to give you three quick lessons. <clears throat> One, I want you to understand the purpose of God's discipline is always to bring you back in right relationship. And so for these ten tribes that he thought that were lost, I want you to look far to the end to the last book in Revelation, you will see those tribes mentioned, except, of course, Dan and Ephraim. And then the second, our choices come with consequences. We might think following God is costly. Try, don't try, don't try, don't try. No, don't try, don't ever try. Know the truth of God's word that everything else is going to be more costly, more expensive, not worth it. It's not eternal. But the third thing, there's an eternal exile that is waiting for rejectors. The ultimate exile. Israel's exile is only a foreshadowing of the eternal exile for all those who reject him. There is a place that, that is kept where God is present only to curse and not to bless. God means business. There are only two kinds of people, one who are exiled and those who are at home. He came down, he lived as an exile so that you will have a home with him for eternity. You don't have to be an exile, my brothers and sisters. You don't have to be unless you choose to. That's the word of God. And I pray for you. Father God, Father God,
I thank you. Thank you for your son. Thank you, Lord, that he would be willing to come live a ho as a homeless, exiled, exiled to Egypt, exiled to Nazareth, lived where he had no place to lay his head. And then on the cross that he lays his head, oh, what a place to lay his head. And all because he can bring us home. And as we read the last few chapters of Revelation, we read that God dwells in the midst. Oh, beautiful, wonderful verse, Lord. Not that we deserved it, but because of your covenantal love that has transformed us, that has brought us home. I pray on this first Sunday of the year that we are we make a clear distinction and a choice to say that God would be our king, the one who we will serve obediently and fully and completely without compromise because he's worthy of all honor, all glory, all praise. So we thank you. I pray there is none here, O oh God. There is none here who would ever be exiled from you from eternity, for eternity, that they will choose, they will understand what it means to to come and to say that they are sinners, they have sinned against you, all of that list of 27 or any of those that match their description, Lord, that they will come and confess and they will say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me, for paying for my, for my sins on the cross. And so because of that, your righteousness is mine and I have a place in heaven. And I pray this, I pray this will be true. For all of us, oh God, we thank you again for answering our prayers in Jesus Christ, our Lord's name.